Welcome to History 112, Lecture 42, The New Frontier and the Great Society. Both the New Frontier and the Great Society had their roots in this idea that there was a new generation of Americans that were full of hope for the future. These are people who had gotten through the Depression, had seen fascism fall in Europe and Japan, had rebuilt the world, in particular the West, to be democratic, had the best nuclear arsenal in the world, and had become more prosperous, healthier, and longer lived than any previous generation of Americans. And all of that is going through the 1950s, and by the time we reach the year 1960, there's also this real hope for change and hope for the future that's entering into this mix. In addition, people have become discontent with the sort of conformity of places like Levittown and there's real desire for something new. And this desire for something new really manifests itself in the two sets of political candidates in the 1960 election. Here you have Richard Nixon, the candidate of the establishment, running against JFK and the Kennedy brothers, the candidates for change and hope. Now, JFK comes from a long-established Massachusetts family that made quite a bit of money selling alcohol during Prohibition. As a result of that money, JFK is going to grow up with quite a bit of privilege attending private schools and places like Harvard. But importantly for JFK, he also served to the U.S. Navy during World War II and is a legitimate war hero. JFK's first major run for office is a run for Congress, and he's going to become a member of the House of Congress on the Democratic ticket in Massachusetts. Now, even though he is not from the baby boomer generation, he is going to really be in touch with that particular group of individuals and really connect with them. And he's going to promote liberal ideas, and in particular, that the government should work for the people. Now, in the 1960 election, standing opposite him is Richard Milhouse Nixon, who is a long-established Republican from California, and he's going to push for strong political and economic conservatism in the form of small government, traditional morality, tax cuts, and he wants, in particular, to be strong on communism. Now, Nixon gained a lot of experience as McCarthy's right-hand man during the early parts of the House investigations about communism, but he's going to manage to keep his hands clean and not be associated with those witch trials. Now that's going to mean he's going to be chosen as Ike's vice president, and he's going to represent their old guard of Republican conservatism, and also he is going to be the legitimate face of being strong on communism, especially after McCarthy's downfall and disgrace. Now when the two square off, the two men couldn't present more of a contrast. JFK is going to look relaxed, young, and handsome. He looks like he's made for TV. He looks groomed. He's PR ready. But Nixon looks stiff, uncomfortable, and sweaty. And this is the nation's first televised debates. It's going to be a very close election. It's only going to be decided by a few thousand votes. And a lot of people think that the fact that it was waged on TV is really going to sway this thing. Because on the radio, JFK lost. He seemed less experienced with the issues. Nixon seemed like he really knew what he was talking about. But on TV, the people who watched it said, Nixon lost. He looked uncomfortable, sweaty, and awkward. People didn't feel like they could trust the answers he was giving. But JFK seemed confident, relaxed, charismatic. Even though Nixon sounded like he was more experienced, JFK sounded more honest. That was the opinion of people who watched it. As the election shapes up, Kennedy's position is essentially that the United States faces serious issues abroad and at home, and we need to spend money to protect and help American interests, especially in Cuba. And the domestic side of that is really going to frame Kennedy's idea of what he calls the new frontier, which we'll get to in a little bit. Nixon, on the other hand, said the United States was just fine after eight years of Ike and Nixon, and if anything, they needed to cut spending because domestic spending on projects was too expensive and unsustainable and Ultimately, according to Nixon, we needed to lower taxes and dial back government control on the economy. Now, JFK is going to win by a very narrow margin. He's going to be the youngest president in American history until Obama. He's also going to be America's first Catholic president. And he's going to assemble the youngest cabinet of any president. And he's going to pull in many Harvard grads and many people he knew from his college days. And his brother, Bobby Kennedy, is going to be attorney general and be one of the most important people in his cabinet, as will be Robert McNamara, his secretary of defense, who is going to be responsible largely for waging the Vietnam War, which we'll get to in a little bit. We look at the map of the election, what we can see is that JFK wins by only about 119,000 votes, but he wins key states, and by winning those key states, he's able to rack up enough votes to get to a comfortable margin. Once in office, JFK is going to pitch the new frontier very strongly, as he set a bold new domestic program centered around education, welfare, healthcare, elderly assistance, revitalizing the inner cities, and continuing a lot of FDR social programs from the New Deal. Now, JFK is going to have a lot of problems, though. He has only a small Democratic majority in Congress. He barely won the presidency. Many congressmen, even from his own party, do not support his policies. 
Christian Southern conservative Democrats do not like him, and he is beholden to that Southern wing of the party to stay in power. And he is also going to battle high inflation. He is going to be facing many obstacles in the Cold War, and most of his legislation simply will not pass. Now, where JFK is successful is that he nominates the conservative judge, Earl Warren, for chief justice. And Earl Warren, once he becomes a member of the Supreme Court, becomes an activist. And he's going to take a stand on a number of important social issues. And the Warren Court is going to really redefine the role of the federal government when it comes to civil rights issues. And this is where JFK's real lasting impact is, is when he changes the Supreme Court in this fashion. Even though JFK presides over a time of real hope that people even nicknamed Camelot after the famous King Arthur legend, JFK delivers very little. He promises we will go to the moon. He promises we will have universal health care. He promises education for everyone. He promises equal rights for women. But none of that actually happens during his presidency. At the end of three years, he had accomplished essentially nothing because Congress did not support him. Now, at the end of that three years, as he's campaigning for re-election, JFK is also assassinated. And in a moment of great national tragedy, the Vice President, Lyndon Baines Johnson, is going to go ahead and take the oath of office and assume the presidency following JFK's death in Texas. Now, LBJ was a far more experienced politician than JFK had been. In 1960, he was a Senate Majority Leader, and he was a de facto leader of a Democratic Party. He was a real power broker in Washington. He was extremely effective at building assistance or breaking down opposition. He felt in 1960 that he should have been the presidential nominee. But when JFK emerged as the candidate, he stepped aside and accepted the vice presidential nomination. And he is going to spend 1961 and 1963 generally being excluded from power by JFK and his brother Bobby. But November 1963, LBJ returns to what he sees as his position as being the leader of the Democratic Party. LBJ coming to power means there's going to be a shift in policy. For, for one thing, the new frontier programs were largely dead in the water, but LBJ is going to take advantage of the wave of emotion overcomes the country and all the new foul support for everything JFK and also the large win in 1964 for Democrats, and they are going to go ahead and get all of JFK's initiatives back on the table, and LBJ is going to take those new frontier programs and roll them into a bigger and more ambitious program that he called the Great Society. And the first three years of LBJ are the most successful presidency since FDR. Now, in the beginning, LBJ's presidency is about what he calls the war on poverty. He's going to begin with things like Medicare and Medicaid. They're going to shift responsibility of paying for the health care for the elderly from patient to government, and is going to give benefits to everyone over 65. And he's opposed on things like Medicare by Republicans who argue that it's socialized medicine. But he's going to get that through a Democratic-controlled Congress. And he's also getting Medicaid through, which is the same thing, but is aimed at those receiving public assistance. He is also going to be very pro-community action. You're going to see federal support for communities to get organized or work on community improvements, like reducing urban blight, developing education, and so on. He's also going to create the federal agencies to help deal with urban decay. LBJ is also going to have another of other major initiatives in the form of the Education Act of 1965 that is going to go ahead and give federal money to schools based on economic status of the students. In other words, they're going to give more money to high poverty areas than the wealthy ones. He's going to go ahead and eliminate national quotas in the Immigration Act of 1965, and he is going to get JFK's tax cuts through. And JFK honestly believed that by cutting taxes on lower income people, this would help develop and spur on the economy. And that's going to leave a large deficit in the budget, but it's going to be offset by the economic growth of the spurs. And the economic growth has been slowing since the 1950s, so LBJ is able to jumpstart it again. And those tax cuts are actually going to go ahead and generate additional revenue that's going to help fund the Great Society programs. But budget deficits are going to begin to rise with increased military expenditures, and we'll talk about how that impacts the Great Society in a subsequent lecture. And we also have to realize that federal spending because of LBJ and his programs is going to increase from $94 billion to $196 billion during the 1960s. And that ultimately is only going to work when the economy is expanding and some other issues are going to enter into that that's going to derail all of these programs. The legacy of the Great Society is hotly debated. Now, during LBJ's presidency, poverty is in fact cut in half. Now, some people argue that's a natural consequence of economic growth brought on by things like the Kennedy tax cuts. Others argue that it was LBJ and his programs. Now, what is objectively true is during LBJ's presidency, hunger decreases within the United States. Elderly are better able to pay for their medical care. 
However, some people say that even though there were these positive benefits, that this was ultimately a failure due to the high cost and the budget strains, LBJ simply could never find the money to invest and do his programs right. And that has a lot to do with the fact that we're also fighting the Vietnam War at the same time. And in a lot of ways, LBJ could have either done the Great Society or done the Vietnam War, but he really couldn't afford to do both. And by doing both, he ultimately derailed both. Now, many people also emerge from the Great Society believing that the very idea of federal intervention to solve social issues is a flawed concept because, again, LBJ had a lot going on and he wasn't able to concentrate on doing any one thing right. So some people feel that because it could not be done right by LBJ, maybe it's a bad idea to begin with. So what's the big idea here? Well, with JFK, it's all about a national desire for change, and JFK's belief that federal power can be used for social good, but ultimately JFK and all of his programs fail. But LBJ comes in, and LBJ is able to do his war on poverty and do everything Kennedy was looking for and more. The only problem is his programs fail due to their high cost, and in the end, LBJ could not have his war on poverty and also fight America's longest war at the same time. See you in the next lecture.